Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mayor Andy Shore, and welcome to our next in the Walking Wednesday series. Uh, we are here at Oak Park, uh, which is a, a wonderful part of Lansing, right up against uh, Saginaw and Oakland by Pennsylvania. Um, they have chestnut trees. Um, so you can see us holding up our chestnuts that we found on the ground. So if you haven't seen chestnuts, um, you can come to Oak Park and check them out. Um, this park has a tremendous amount of history here in the city of Lansing, um, but I'm not going to tell you all about it because we have our local resident historian, Bill Castanier, is going to tell you all about everything that has happened at Oak Park and the history in this wonderful park. Thank you, Mayor, very much for this. This is a great opportunity. This is one of the most historic places in Lansing, actually. Uh, it's a 20-acre park. It was originally called Eastside Park, First Ward Park also. It originally was a cemetery, and the cemetery was about down there. And it was this was at the edge of town when it was a cemetery in the 1870s. And it was believed, and as Lansing was moving east and west, that this was prime land, and the cemetery was moved in the 1870s. We're also going to learn more about one of the happiest times, is the school back there was the, was the first school that the Morlock quadruplets went to and that was also just to the south of it is the Lansing's first home for children which was built during the depression um, one of the things that was also here was a baseball diamond you can see it's roughly in the same place here as it was then uh, every weekend uh, and during the week there would be thousands of people out here watching baseball games it, almost every major industry had a very, very good baseball team back in that era, and they had bleachers that would seat 2,500 people. Um, if you look further, further through those trees, you're going to see a natural bowl. It's no one really knows where it, how it originated, but they believe it's part of the Mason Escar. And that is almost one of the highest locations in the city of Lansing. If you go up at the top, you can see way downtown. It's very, very cool. After the cemetery was moved, what happened was there was a tremendous need for recreation, especially water recreation. As most people who live around here know, we only have Lake Lansing, Pine Lake, so there wasn't any water in the center of the city. There was a one acre watering hole, basically, that was left over from farming days. And the city parks department turned it into a, a kind of like a, a, a large swimming pool. It was about knee deep, little, maybe somewhat a little higher. And on a hot summer day, there'd be thousands of kids and their parents down here in that pool area. There was a one acre um, island in the center of it where they was constructed a large fountain and kids used to climb on that and jump in the water, which was not too safe because it was very shallow. Um, this It had a small bridge that went from what would be called the mainland right in here, out over into, into the uh, one acre island. It was the most popular summer destination in the entire city. Um, in 1897, something kind of funny occurred. City officials thought that carp would be a good idea. So they planted carp in the pond, and carp do what carp do. <laughs> they thrive. And so in, within one year, you could, you could almost walk across the pond because of the carp. Those had to go, and, and they eliminated them that, that year. But that was one of the funniest things. They, they were still learning about the science of carp, I think. And they thought they were pretty, and they were the big carp, the giant German carp. Um, in 1897, when uh, the school building was being constructed, not this one, the one that was previous to this one, it was called Lasher Place School, F five coffins were discovered. They didn't quite get them all when they moved. So th this is kind of an eerie place, especially for the ghost walkers. Um, in 1914, that concrete building, which is still here, that was where it was kind of the warming shed and storage shed. And if you get up close to it and take a look, there's some interesting architectural elements to it, um, for, especially for a concrete building. One of the most interesting things is this was the second park that had daily recreational activities for children in the summer. So every day during the summer, there'd be four or 500 children in this park um, with well-organized events. And what happened, 
was formed in the early 20s up through the 30s was there would be an annual day every summer where all the parks would get together and they'd form a pageant here. They'd practice all summer to do it and the kids would perform an hour, hour and a half. There was, there was a 300 children lantern parade to start it off. But there was an, it was amazing because during that period of time, there would, they would put up bleachers for 2,500 and another 7,000 would sit up on that bowl over there. So that was t almost 10,000 people in a time when Lansing had a population of about 70,000 people. So they had to come here on the trolley that, off of Michigan, or off of, yes, Michigan. Uh, they probably walked, but this was in the 1930s. There was nothing to do. There was no, really no television, little radio, and people were poor, and this was free entertainment, so they came to see their children. I, I can't imagine what it was like, 10,000 people sitting on that, on that hill. You wouldn't want to sit on it today because the uh, woodchucks pretty much own it, <laughs> and it's really, you have to be careful going up it. There's a, a thought that that hill, as I mentioned, uh, was from the, the Mason Escar. And if you follow how it kind of goes off south, you can still see remnants of it on Michigan Avenue. There was a sand dune back there in the 50s that was torn out for construction that was 20, 30 feet tall. And children, uh, adults my age now, talk about playing on it. Um, it was excavated in the 1950s and 60s when people... Um, wanted to have a more commercial Michigan Avenue. When it was really dry out here, you could see a path um, that went down into the pond area. And when we started looking around a, a year ago, we discovered that th there's bricks laid here. These are city paving bricks. And they go all the way down in there. And I think that one time they may have gone around the cemetery. But they go, they're about three foot wide. And it looks like, as we started to uncover some of them, it's a variety of bricks from a variety of manufacturers. And our thought was they were leftover bricks from paving the city streets. But that would be a grid project for someone. <laughs> Maybe an Eagle Scout project is to uncover all these bricks because they are pretty extensive. And like I said, we just discovered it by accident because you could see it because it hadn't rained in a while. But they're starting to get a good inch of dirt on them now, so. But we thought it was a fun little thing that every now and then you find, find items like that. Um, why don't we take a walk, another walk if we can, to the school. Behind me is the Neogen's offices for marketing, advertising, and promotion. But before it was Neogen, it was the Oak Park School. And before that, it was called the Lesher Place School. Uh, we're standing really on Lesher Place, which is a street in Lansing. This um, school opened in 1917. There are several schools around Lansing that are very similar in construction to this. Uh, prior to this school opening, there was another small uh, wood construction school here called Lesher Place. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the first school in the city in 1922 that was an, what it was called an open air school, which means during the winter, they kept their windows open. All the windows were open and it was meant to confront disease because we had just come off the 1918-1919 pandemic. Um, and <clears throat> what kids did was dressed in like snowsuits and they took all their classes in open air and they, at one o'clock they'd take a nap for an hour it was a forest nap um, when when it really got too cold the kids all had what, what I could only refer to as darling uh, matching hoods and jackets it was really cute when you see the photographs um, it was, uh, a, like I mentioned, it was like a, at least probably 10 other schools around the city that looked much, much like this. But it had one remarkable thing about it. In 1935, the Morlock Quadruplets started school here. And that, for a period of about 10 years, 
it dramatically changed how this school was seen because the Morlocks were quadruplets who were born in 1930. And there are four identical quadruplets, which at the time was exceedingly rare. I think they may have been the only ones in the world. Um, they were called the ABCD babies. <clears throat> and it was for their order of birth. They later named them Edna A, Wilma B, Sarah C, and Helen D. There's a book written about them called The Alphabet Sisters. As you can imagine, their first day of school was covered by the media, the last day of school. So this school was in the newspaper and on later on radio and other, other uh, newsreels all the time. Uh, they were adorable little girls. Uh, they all grew up in Lansing, uh, stayed here most of their life. Um, their father was given a uh, job as the Justice of Peace because it was during the Depression they were born, so they had no income. But they received gifts from all over the world. Um, in 1999, I believe, um, Neogen purchased this building, and they've owned it ever since. And I think it's a great reuse and readaptive use, which Lansing has done very well in school district or schools. We've we've reused most of our schools in really good ways. Let's walk down to another building that Neogen owns that has a, also a remarkable history and an infamous history, frankly. We're in front of another uh, building owned by Neogen. Most people don't know what it is, but it has a very interesting history. It was built in 1928 and occupied in 1929. Uh, the reason it was built, it was a home for uh, wards of the city. This was during the Depression, and it was not uncommon for family to give up children that they couldn't support. So this uh, became a location or a home for 40 children. And 18 of those children walked maybe 100 yards to go to Oak Park School. And it had, I think it would be very interesting to find the history of those. We just learned about this, so most, most clearly, most of those people are not alive currently, but it must have been an interesting time. They had a remarkable place to live. I mean, they lived on a playground, um, baseball games were being played, and they only had to walk 100 yards to their school. Um, after this uh, closed in 1947, it became a, a um, an add-on to Sparrow Hospital. This was the first pediatric hospital in Lansing. And Lansing had grown so fast that Sparrow could not handle the number of children uh, that, that were coming, had to be hospitalized. The first uh, patient in this hospital then was a six-year-old girl who had a tonsillectomy. In the 60s and 70s, this place was turned into a halfway house uh, for children and they occupied about 20 at a time. They'd stay anywhere from just a few months to a year. Uh, many would be go to foster homes or be adopted or go back to their families after counseling and things. You can probably tell that were right, right on Pennsylvania Avenue, which was one of the premier locations in Lansing to live on in the 1930s. Uh, across the street is the new Eastern uh, High School Sports Complex. Uh, behind me is the Salvation Army. Um, historically, it's not known as the Salvation Army, but rather it's known as the first and the original Shari Zedek Jewish Temple in Lansing. It opened in March 1932 with 300 in attendance. And it was the first Jewish house of worship in the city. Prior to that time, those of Jewish faith would meet in individuals' homes. Uh, the congregation moved to East Lansing in 1968, and the building was converted in, into the Salvation Army at that time. We're gonna take a short walk to take a look at two Darius Moon homes. Uh, which are on the corner of Saginaw and Pennsylvania.
this house. It was originally built for William Dudley. Uh, some people may remember that name. William Dudley was the founder and owner of the Dudley Paper Company. Dudley Paper Company was one of the largest paper companies in Michigan, and William Dudley was one of the richest men in Lansing. Um, this is what is known as an Italianate house. Um, it has narrow windows that you can see on the second floor. I think the windows on the first floor have been changed out. But one thing you'll notice that kind of people uh, believe is characteristic of an Italianate is it looks like a wedding cake. And what's missing on this one was would probably be a top crow's nest of some sort or a walk around uh, that's probably been taken off in the in the 50s or 60s. Uh, but you would these houses definitely look like a wedding. You'll see them around Lansing. They look like a wedding cake. They're ornate. They have cornices. A lot of them have more gingerbread than this one, and it did, could have originally had more gingerbread. Uh, Dudley William Dudley probably walked to work every day because his offices and um, building was on Shiawassee, right at Lesher Place. The next thing we're going to do is go look right across the street, and we're going to take a look at two Darius Moon houses. Darius Moon was probably Lansing's most famous architect, and he worked from 1870 until 1922, so he had a more than 50-year career. Uh, he built, designed and built more than 260 homes in Lansing and, and business structures. Only a handful of those exist now. The rest have been torn down. But the two homes across the street we're going to spend just a little time, of time with and you'll get an idea of the kind of homes that Darius Moon is most famous for. Darius Moon was doing his work at a time when architects blended a variety of styles, including Greek Revival and Queen Anne. Both those styles we see at the houses across the street. You'll typically find large, expansive porches and use of columns. Both these homes have numerous columns in them. There in, there's interesting uh, takes from East Lake and Victorian on both those structures. You're going to see overhanging eaves and layering of wood styles. Typically, a moon house will have narrow windows on the ground floor, and one expert in architecture has said that moon was a, among many architects working at the time who worshipped timber. In other words, they loved to build stick houses. Moon houses also have steeply pitched roofs and often would have decorative roof cresting. And we mentioned a variety of styles. They would often use gingerbread treatments, and these could be ordered out of catalogs, so you didn't have to build them on site. And windows would often have extended bays and seats with secret compartments. And the glass would be decorative, ranging from leaded glass to stained glass. The one at 610, which is directly across the street, the lighter one, was constructed for a plumber, Thomas Shields, who was a longtime resident and master plumber. His best estimate of it when it was constructed is 1902. Now the brown house next door was also built for a plumber. Plumbing was obviously a very lucrative profession in the early 1900s. And if you think about it, it's because people were putting indoor plumbing in. This house was built for George Gordon. He was another successful Lansing plumber. The cost of this home in 19, or 1898 was only $2,500, which was really a fortune at that time. It has eight columns, numerous gables. It has triple hung windows a three-sided Oriel window on the second floor with a triangular window above. It also has that big sitting porch. Gordon was responsible for the fountain in downtown Lansing at Router Park. Um, I think that um, these two houses, although now on a busy, busy street, at that time this was a quiet street. And uh, I think it was considered almost in the country. But they were built close together. As you can see, the cost of upkeep for a moon home is tremendous. Painting is never ending. And over, over the years, many of these homes have also lost their decorative treatments. We're here 
to talk about some of the development and the things that we've done here in this neighborhood. So we've acquired, let me give you a little few stats. We've acquired 36 properties in this area. We have completed one new construction that was partnering with the city's planning and development office. That's over on May Street. We have demolished 26 properties and we have a few gardens here. We've invested over $650,000 in this area and this whole neighborhood area. We still have about 28 properties left and 18 to 25 of them are designated for large development. So, which is something we're pretty excited about. We have sold a few properties to Neogen. They are planning to develop them. That's a great thing. We're pretty excited about that. But our big development that we want to talk about is behind us. It's on the north side of Saginaw Street. And we are working with a large developer to hopefully develop some of these properties over here. We own about 22 properties on the north side of Saginaw, and what we'd like to do is develop them. There are too many vacant lots. We want something done with them. So we're working with the developer. It's pretty exciting. We're hoping that in another year that we're going to have some exact plans and we're going to be reaching out to residents and seeing what their thoughts are and get their information from them and hopefully develop all this behind us. So it's pretty exciting. East Park Terrace, Pennsylvania, May Street, Saginaw area. It's pretty exciting. So the other property that we want to just briefly talk about is this commercial building behind us here. It's over on Saginaw. And this actually came to the county treasurer in a foreclosure several years ago. It sold at auction and was renovated and they had some businesses in there and then a few years ago that fell apart and it went into foreclosure again this year. The county treasurer is actually working with a nonprofit agency that is trying to do something with that building and nothing has been set in stone yet but we're excited we're hoping that that building can actually turn around and actually have something done with it and maybe a business it looks like it could be a live work situation which I think is missing here in Lansing so that would be a really great thing for that to happen so hopefully good plans coming forward on that So there you have it, that's our Walking Wednesday for the Oak Park neighborhood. Such a fascinating neighborhood, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Lansing, and we learned a lot of information. If your neighborhood wants to host a Walking Wednesday, contact the Department of Neighborhoods and Citizen Engagement. Our website is lansingneighborhoods.info, or simply give us a call at 517-483-4051. My name is Delisa Fontaine, and thank you from the City of Lansing and all of our partners.